Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's inaugural lecture. I'm Kevin Shakespeare. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, Enterprise and Scholarship here at the, at the Open University. And um, opening up our inaugural lectures is one of the, the real pleasures um, of the job. I think they're a fantastic celebration of, of academic careers and the great things that universities do. So I'm delighted to be here this evening. Um, the inaugural lectures are actually invited by the Vice-Chancellor and Tim's here um, this evening, um, and they are an opportunity to celebrate our academic excellence. And uh, the great diversity that we see during the year is, is one of the real celebrations. So this evening, we're hearing from Professor Karen Olson Francis, and she's going to explore her work um, on rethinking the boundaries of, of life and astrobiology. I should say the lecture is also available in Welsh and the reasons will become clear during, during the lecture. So let me now introduce Professor Nick Braithwaite, who will be known to many of you as the Executive Dean uh, for the, the STEM faculty, and he's going to take us through um, the introduction to Karen. Over to you, Nick. Yes, hello, everybody, uh, and uh, that includes people who are watching online, various parts of this planet, and possibly, for all I know, other planets too. <laughs> Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here talking about Karen Holson Francis. Karen is Professor of Geomicrobiology. There's a lot of words coming up now, so be careful. Geomicrobiology, it's all one word. And she's operating in the School of Environment, Earth and Ecosystem Sciences. And she's Director of Astrobiology. Astro, out there, biology, possibly. One thinks of it as being closer here, but there is a, a very strong connection which she has been responsible for developing, certainly around here at the OU, hence she is Director of Astrobiology OU. And there she's got a group of about 60 scientists and social scientists, governance experts, educators. There's, a, there's an interesting thing there, how broad this team is. And, and they are there to create a large interdisciplinary group, the largest one in Europe working on astrobiology. She's homegrown. She's, she's one of us. We claim her. She studied with us as a postdoc uh, and has been developing her career ever since. Uh, but I think it's, it's that ability to connect across the boundaries which distinguishes her from uh, many of us. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the, the strengths we'll be hearing about. Look out for it. She bridges traditional boundaries in her work across multiple uh, schools here in the faculty uh, and across the faculties the Arts and Social Science faculty and the Business and Law faculty are involved in Karen's work. And she's worked in some of the most extreme environments. Uh, and as many as you will know, working in a lecture theatre can be considered a, an extreme environment as well. And she's operated experiments on the International Space Station. Uh, Karen is in the UK, uh, she is the UK's national representative on the Committee on Space Research, International Planetary Protection Panel. She, and actually what she's doing is very germane to that, and that's why she gets uh, singled out for these things. She's also part of UK Space Exploration Advisory Group. She's chair of the Geomicrobiology Committee, a founding member of the European Astrobiology Institute, and an elected member of the European Astrobiology Net Association. Uh, that's a, an impressive list of credentials, and I can tell you no more. I need Karen to come here and tell you some more in her lecture. Karen, please come and join us. Thank you, everybody. Um, the last time I actually gave a lecture in public was actually standing here back in January 2020, where we actually launched Astrobiology OU. And um, a lot has happened since then, and I'll be touching on some of that work here today. Um, if you want to follow us on Twitter, here are our Twitter handles down here on the right. And actually, we'll be live tweeting some of the relevant papers that the group have produced, some of the work that we talk about. So if you see a symbol and you follow us on Twitter, there'll be um, a link to the papers as well. So, are we alone in the universe? It's probably one of the most captivating questions in our time. It's one of the driving forces behind the field of astrobiology. It covers everything from the origins of life on early Earth, right through to habitability in our solar system and finding evidence of life through life detection missions. As a science, it crosses the boundaries between planetary 
earth and biological sciences. But here at the Open University, we push those boundaries. We push those boundaries to include science, social sciences and humanities. As Nick mentioned, we formed Astrobiology OU, which is a unique group which brings together experts from across multiple faculties within the university. In this lecture, I will outroll the small part that I've played in building this group, the life choices that have led to the role I'm in today, and the support that I've let, had over the years which have made all of this possible. So going back to Kevin's note about why is this going to be translated into Welsh, well, growing up in a small Welsh village in North Wales, being educated through the media in Welsh, astrobiology wasn't a natural career decision for me. Um, I actually spent my summers working in a Wrexham lager, and if any of you ever tasted the delights of Wrexham lager, it has to be one of the most finest beers in the world. But I went to university convinced I was going to do a degree in brewing and distilling. Um, but it was actually while I was at university, I developed an interest in microbiology. So microbiology is the study of microbial life, and these microbes are generally naked to the eye. And what we know about microbes is that they are ubiquitous on Earth, so they are found nearly everywhere. So this is going to scare you guys. This picture here is of a swipe from the surface of a mobile phone. You've all got them in your pockets, I know it, admit it. But there's going to be microbes like this growing on there, so just be prepared for that. But seriously though, that microbes do play such a huge part in everyday life. They, they shape the environment that we live in and our health. And there's approximately 5 million trillion trillion microbial cells on Earth, and they're one of the major causes of sources of organic carbon. And what we know about microbial life is probably one of the most earliest forms of life. Evidence suggests that about 3.7 billion years ago, the evidence of, um, of evidence of life existing. So we think that microbial life is one of the most earliest forms. What we do know, like most life, that there's three key requirements. It all needs a liquid water, it needs, a bio, it needs um, chemicals, um, bioessential elements, and it needs an energy source. So as us as humans, we get energy from eating food and respiring oxygen. But life overall has evolved to use a much wider array of, of, of chemicals. So for example, there's lots of microorganisms that actually live in anaerobic environments, and, uh, and oxygen actually kills them. Also, we have organisms that can use inorganic, carb inorganic um, compounds rather than organic compounds. So, for example, molecular hydrogen, sulfide, ferrous ions, to name but a few. And studying these microbes and um, the complexity and extremity of these microbial lives on Earth actually enable us to speculate about the existence of life on other planets, both within our solar system and beyond. And the way that these microorganisms adapt mean that they can live in some of the most extreme environments on Earth. These are not my holiday shots, but they are of New Zealand. Louise Thomas actually proudly let me have these. And we know from looking at these kind of extreme environments that there's a number of, they're teeming with microbial life. So we know that life can live in hydrothermic vents, in mud pools, and the environmental conditions of these are really extremes. And microbes that can live in these environments are what we call extremophiles, so extreme loving microorganisms. Ooh. It's a bit, a bit of an OU video here I had to put in just to keep you all on your toes. So microbes can live in hot pools and desert environments, the bottom of the ocean. So microbes that live in hot environments above 65 degrees are called thermophiles. We have microbes that can live in really cold environments that are called sacrophiles. Um, and they can live in, and then we have microbes that can live in multiple extremes. Everything from high pH and temperature through to desiccation and UV resistant. And then we kind of have this group of organisms that are called like, they're very much the superhero of the microbial world, which can survive everything as high temperatures, low pH, high, um, high salinity, and even nuclear waste. But some of those environments that I showed you towards the end are actually, um, it's more common to have more than one extreme. These are kind of environments, so for example, we look at hydrothermic systems, we don't just have the high temperatures, we're, they're normally either highly acidic or highly alkaline as well. 
and the life that live within these environments are called polyextremophiles. Do you see a trend coming in here? <laughs> polyextremophiles are microbes that can live in multiple extreme environments. Um, from everything from salinity to high pH, etc. So when I started to think about doing a PhD, I just finished traveling around New Zealand and I felt, you know, I really love microbiology and studying extremophiles to me was kind of a natural step. At the time, there'd been a lot of work looking at individual extremes on microbes, very much from a biotechnological perspective, but there wasn't much work that's been done looking at the mechanisms and evolution of adaptation to multiple extremes. And so when I was doing my PhD, starting thinking about PhD, this is when this kind of work was starting. Um, I was lucky to get an international fellowship to go to the University of Otago in New Zealand, where I was able to study this. And you know, I took, going back to those initial photos, New Zealand is a prime location to look at these extreme environments. But also, obviously, you can't go to New Zealand without appreciating the culture, the environment, and obviously the All Blacks. I have to put that one in there. So the work um, that I was particularly looking at was a microbe. That sounds just one microbe. I spent three years studying a microbe. That's correct. Um, but this microbe was special. Um, it was isolated from a geyser um, on Mount Taraha, which is the only Maori word I know, but translates to the mountain of love. If anyone's ever interested, I can do Maori translation for you. Um, but what was interesting about this geyser is that the pH was about 9.5 and the the temperature was above 65 degrees. So this microorganism, which was called um, TA201, which just um, hasn't actually been classified, and was able to survive in these extreme environments. And what we know from studying extreme files under single conditions that high temperature causes um, problems with membrane fluidity, and this causes problems with biochemistry. We know that um, in highly um, alkaline environments, the microbes have to maintain the pH within the cytoplasm to keep it near neutral, otherwise it impacts on biochemical processes. So the work that I was doing was looking at how a microbe combines were able to survive both of these conditions. So I did a lot of work looking at the bioenergetics, so looking at how it could produce ATP under these multiple conditions. So what we were able to look at was looking at the physiology of it, looking at the sodium antiporters that it could survive and the mechanisms that it could employ. But when I started my PhD though, probably two years into my PhD, Lynn and Rocco, um, Lynn Rothschild and Rocco Mancinelli, who um, wrote this review paper, and this is probably one of the most pivotal papers um, of my career. It was a review in Nature about, and it talked about space as a new category for studying extreme environments. And when I meet Lynn and Rocco at conferences, I constantly, you know, I always bring up this paper because this is one of the pivotal moments for me. And in that paper, Lynn and Rocco talk about space as another frontier for studying extremophiles. And they look at it and they talk about it in two ways. They talk about it in the concept of lithopanspermia, which is the transfer of life from one planet to another. So, for example, life from Earth that could be transferred to life on Mars. They also look at it and um, talk about it as a way of habitability, which is something which has become very um, key to the work we've been doing over the years. And they think about habitability in the solar system. There's kind of two areas that we're focusing on at the moment, and predominantly that's the icy moons um, and Mars. And if we go back to this diagram I showed you previously, you know, there's key requirements for life. It needs liquid water, it needs chemical energy, and it needs bioessential elements. So if we look at the icy moons, so for example, Europa and Enceladus, evidence suggests that these deep um, oceans there, which again, you know, which, which supplies water, a watery environment, and there's also think that there's hydrothermic um, activity within the deep subsurface. And these produce chemical gradients, which can allow microorganisms to live. And thermochemical modeling of the composition of this ocean suggests that my, potentially microbial lives could exist within these oceans. Again, when we look at Mars, when we think about Mars, um, we think about early Mars, so about 3.6 billion years ago. The conditions on early Mars, we think, were very similar to that on early Earth. These large fluvial systems existed, which evidence um, suggests from some of the work that's ongoing at the moment. And as time and the atmosphere 
um, evaporated, it leads to the evaporation of the water, leading to these evaporitic deposits on the surface. Um, so if life did ex actually exist within the sub um, today on, on Mars, it would be in the subsurface where it is actually protected from the detrimental conditions on the surface. Because the surface is very arid, it's very, and it's really um, highly exposed to radiation. Oh. Um, that was a bit of a quick slide, I didn't do my introduction there. So, although you know, I was starting to become interested in astrobiology, my career kind of took a bit of a shift. Um, I, left, I left academia, I left academia for two years and went to go and work in a um, research institute in New Zealand called Ag Research. And this is a Crown Research Institute that was very much focused on doing science to help society. So at the time, New Zealand was very much involved with the Kyoto Agreement about methane emissions. And it might not surprise you, but there's more sheep and more livestock in New Zealand than there are people. There's about 5 million people in New Zealand where there's about 35 million um, livestock. And these livestocks are called uh, ruminants. This means that they are able, to, when they eat their food, they have, they're able to ferment, um, they break down the food, they ferment it and releasing methane into the environment. So methane from cows and um, livestock in New Zealand contribute to about 43% of their greenhouse emissions, which is really high um, for a developed country. So the work that we were doing that I was focused on was trying to manipulate the ecosystems within the ruminant, changing the composition of it, if by changing foods or using phages or viruses to um, change it so the methanogens within the ruminants um, would not produce methane by changing the, the ecosystem in there. I promise you there is, a, there, there is a reason for this slide and I will come back to it. It does fit into the astrobiology story, I promise you. Um, but after that though, I decided, you know, I did have a permanent position and gave it up um, because I wanted to go back into academia um, and Rob and I decided we were going to move back to the UK for two years. We were just coming for two years. The plan was we'd be back for 2011 for the Rugby World Cup in New Zealand. 14 years later, we're still here. Um, it gets worse. The picture here, <laughs> the picture here, Coco Cabana Beach. Um, I was sitting on a beach with Rob drinking this, and I was like, Rob, there's this job come up. It's in Milton Keynes. You are going to love Milton Keynes. It's right on the beach. <laughs> At the time, I hadn't lived in the New Zealand, in the UK for eight years, so my geography was a little bit skewy. We are, I do know that we are at the most landlocked place within the whole of the UK. But we're still here, we're still living the dream in Milton Keynes. Um, but what we did find though, um, that job that was advertised was working with Professor Charles, um, Charles Cockell, who was an established astrobiologist, um, and still is an established astrobiologist, and the work that um, he um, the, was looking at, that I was involved with, was looking at the survivability of microorganisms in simulated and real low Earth orbit conditions. And at the time, and it still is, the OU was a fantastic place to do this. I mean, it's such an honor to have um, Judith Pellinger actually in the crowd today. She played such a key part in that at the time. And we have some amazing environmental simulation chambers, which um, Manish Patel runs now which allow us to actually simulate some of these conditions um, in, at, at the Open University, which is, which, is, which is really unique and a great opportunity for us as, as researchers. And at the time, experiments in low Earth orbit was, it was coming really exciting time. So I joined at the OU in 2008 and it was just coming to the end of the Bioplan experiments. So on the left, the big Ball there, that's a biome experiment, and basically it is launched into low Earth orbit on a photon mission, on a photon rocket, opens up exposing experiments, closes, and then it's returned to Earth. They're very short time scale experiments, you know, the typical between 10 and 13 days. But in 2008, I think that was probably the last one, we got some experiments um, brought back from that. But this also coincided with the start of experiments on the International Space Station. Um, the advantage of the International Space Station was that these are experiments that could be taken for, for on, on yearly um, timescales, normally between 18 months upwards. And what we do with these, you can see quite clearly in the, in the image on the right, is that we can put samples in them and then using filters with different um, intensities, we can kind of manipulate the conditions within in the chambers. So if we use a cutoff filter of 200 nanometers and we can put um, 
a Martian gas composition in there, we can kind of simulate the conditions on the surface of Mars. So these experiments are not just looking at low Earth orbit conditions, but they also allow us to look at simulated Mars conditions in low Earth orbit as well. Um, and there've been the, over the years, there's been a lot of experiments that've been looking at the survival of microbes and biosignatures in space. I think there's something like a thousand species that have been looked at over the years. But what we did here at the OU was a very different approach. So we ended. Uh, what we were focused on was actually rather than looking at survival or organisms in low Earth orbit, we were using the conditions of low Earth orbit to select from extreme aphilic microorganisms. So another, again, another nice sunny um, coastal picture here. This time we have beer in Devon. And what we did was we collected samples from the limestone cliffs, as you can see in the image on the left. And these, um, these limestone cliffs are exposed to periods of desiccation, radiation, and high salinity. And as you can see this green layer here, this is um, cyanobacteria and algae. And what we did was we were able to collect samples from here and we could expose them as part of the exposed mission and the biopan mission. So actually at the bottom right corner here, you can see some of the dark controls. So under the layer, we have samples that are exposed to space conditions. We also have um, dark controls as well. And the work that we did, we were able to isolate um, an organism called Glea Capsa. I'm on brand here, OU20. Um, and we were able to study that to look at how microbes can survive. And what we found was that these, these organisms were able to produce this really thick extra polysaccharide, which could support, um, which, which could let it, um, the radiation did not penetrate. And also they produce these kind of big clump materials, as you can see on this image close on the right. So they can kind of stump together. So although the, the radiation and the conditions could penetrate the first couple of layers, they were still able to survive the cells in the middle. Here I'm going to do another celebrity shot. Um, continue working, uh, although this is work was funded, ended up at the beginning as postdocs, we've continued to work in this area and we've recently just done some work, we just finished analysing some experiments in the Biome experiment. So we've got Nisha Ramkison here in the audience. We were looking at the effect of low Earth orbit conditions on key biosignatures. So looking at how molecules were actually degraded under Mars conditions and making a database that could be then used by um, um, instruments that are on Mars at the moment to see how we, they compare. Um, but this is probably one of my favorite ESA stories is that the Biomex experiment actually came down with Tim Peake and um, the email I got from ESA, well, we all got from ESA was saying, we're a bit worried about the vibration shocks returning to Earth. So we've asked the astronauts to use their dirty clothes and stuff it under their seats so it doesn't <laughs> vibrate. And, and I asked him about this at the time, and well, afterwards when I met him, and he goes, actually, that is a true story. And as a microbiologist, I'm a little bit concerned about the integrity of those samples, but hey, <laughs> who am I to complain? Um, and I think then, though, there was a bit of a, a shift, um, a change. You know, I was very lucky. We had Emily and Matthew. Um, Emily, and this... Um, um, and as everybody who's in planetary science in the UK did, at this time, a contract was coming to an end, and I put my hands, my, my hands was in, my life was in the gods of the consolidated grant, SGSE consolidated grant. I was waiting to see what would happen there. So we were lucky, I think, there was uh, Manish and Vic and, and Charles wrote a grant, and it was successful. I was named postdoc, but by a twist of fate, Charles took the labs and moved to Edinburgh, um, which, you know, which was fantastic opportunity for him but it meant for us as a family though that I you know we were very settled here down here so I stayed which meant when I went on maternity leave I had about a year left on my contract but thankfully to Sue Horn and the UK Space Agency and the Aurora um, there was a, a call of Aurora fellowships out um, at the time so I packed I think it was it kind of got announced just after I um, went on maternity leave and I packed up my six-week-old six daughter and moved in with my parents for three weeks and wrote a fellowship. Um, yeah, and it was successful, but we're going back to the cow story. <laughs> so this is where it all fits together now. So in 2004, Mars Express suggested there was methane on Mars. 2011, NASA reported high resolution of methane. 
um, from Earth Observations. And then 2012, which happened to coincide with my fellowship application, Curiosity rover repeated methane, uh, measured methane on the surface of Mars. So on Earth, methane is either produced abiotically, and this can be due to circulation of rocks producing hydrogen, which re reacts with carbon dioxide to produce methane, or, as I showed with the cows, it could be produced by biology. So what the work that I was doing was very much looking to see if methanogenic microbes from extreme environments were able to grow under simulated Martian conditions. So we can simulate the conditions of Mars by using um, regolith, which, which kind of, sim we know what the chemistry is, so we can simulate that here on Earth, um, to see if these microbes could actually live in the subsurface and produce methane. But this was linked to um, the Aurora mission, so very much focused on biosignatures. And as well as methane being a potential biosignature, I kind of got interested in looking, um, due to the colleagues, which I'll mention in a minute, geological biosignatures. So these are actually secondary minerals, alteration minerals that are formed due to physical, chemical um, alteration to um, existing primary minerals. And these minerals are produced differently depending if it's an abiotic or biotic system. So they can be used as a signature to detect life. And what we, the instruments that we have on Mars at the moment are able to kind of um, to measure some of these key um, secondary minerals as well. So at the time, um, I was really lucky to be at the Open University. You know, I felt I had such a great group of peers um, around me. So Suzanne Twencher, who has COVID tonight, um, so hi Susanna. Um, she, was, she was part of the um, Curiosity um, science team. So she was actually involved in the, the mission that I mentioned back in 2012. She's also a Martian guru mineralogist. Um, and then as well as that, we have Manish Patel, who is the co-PI of the Nomad instrument, which is on the Trace Gas Orbiter, which is circulate, which is orbiting around Mars, looking, one of its goals was to look for methane. And then we have Vic Pearson, who is a, a, an absolute guru on um, organic geochemistry and understanding carbon on Mars, and is a very good translator of between me and Susanna when we couldn't understand each other, because interdisciplinary science can be very difficult. We now get each other, it's just taken a bit of time. But what this did mean, though, was that we weren't just coming from disciplinary boundaries, different points of view. It meant that we could look at our experiments different. And this is kind of the, the way that we've started to do our research. So we could take data from Mars, um, direct from the missions. Susanna could thermochemically model it. So look at that, using that information to predict what the chemical environment would be. So this would allow us to look at the composition of potential water on Mars to see if it has the chemicals that we need and the, the physical environment. And then this is where I come in. We would take microbes from extreme environments and then we could simulate them under lab conditions to look if um, they could grow under Mars conditions and what biosignatures that they could produce. So in this chamber that we, we, um, we actually officially opened the labs today, um, we would um, put in some Martian regolith. Again, Nisha Ramkison was, was leading on this work um, and looking at how they can change their, how my, if the microbes can grow in these environments and what biosignatures they could use. Um, I was doing, as well as the lab work, we were doing a lot of simulation, um, sorry, analog work in, in, um, in field work, analog field work. So, this is a game we play when we do outreach. It's guess which is Mars and which is Earth, but I'm not going to make you a guess today. On the right here, we have the Atacama, and on the left here, we have um, the surface of Mars. And if you take the roads and the buildings that have the Atacama in, in, in picture, they do look very similar. But it don't just look similar. They're physically, some of the, 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 the parameters within them are very similar as well. So we have fluctuations in temperature. They're very desiccated environments. They could be high. UV, well, not as high, obviously, on Mars as on Earth, but there's kind of environments which allow us to look at microbial life in a similar way as we can on Earth. So we kind of use this model to look at habitability on um, beyond the Earth by using analogues on Earth. And there's no perfect analogue site. It all depends on what environment you're looking and what time period that you're looking at as well. So... Um, 
Here are some of the places that the group's been over the last few years. So we've been everywhere from the salt pans in Botswana, um, right through where we're using as an analogue for present day service of Mars, right through to Svalbard and Iceland, looking at these cold environments as well. So there's a whole <coughs> selection of environments that we can use to look at these. So there's no one perfect analogue I think for me though, personally, probably the most extreme environment that I've ever been to is the Danakil Depression, the hydrothermic system there. Um, this was back in 2000 and 2017 when access to the sites was getting, becoming more open, infrastructure was put in place. Um, it's really extreme. So this water you think is water is actually acid, about pH zero. The temperature is about on an, on, in the morning when you go sampling, it's about 36 to 38 degrees, but actually can rise up to 50 degrees in the heat of the say. So these are like super saturated hydrothermic waters um, and they form this bedrock and they're very sulfuric acid environments. So the work we were doing was looking at if biosignatures of life could exist within these evaporitic deposits. So the environment is actually too extreme for active life to be definitely growing within these environments. <coughs> Um, but what we can see are kind of little cells, like um, bio morphological biosignatures within the evaporitic deposits. I think, you know, from a scientific perspective, going out into the field was an absolutely amazing for, uh, opportunity for me. But I think what did hit me more, though, and I think this was, again, a very pivotal point to, to my career, was actually the um, people, the local and indigenous communities. So this is the local village that we stayed in. Um, so the beds that we slept in can be seen down here on the right. The picture above is that hut is where we kept all our science equipment. Um, we had armed guards because even back in 2017 there was still um, concern about terrorism attacks. And the whole economy before tourism and science came through there was very much driven by the salt industry in the region. And this place really touched me. I think I wanted to give back to the environment, the, the community that we, we were there with. Um, so back in 2018, myself and um, Barbara Kavalatsky <coughs> from the University of Bologna went back to the University of Macalay um, in Ethiopia and set up a workshop which the aim of it was to teach teachers in that region, in the Afar region of Ethiopia, about their local environment. It, you know, it was about science, but it was about helping them in business, you know, Ecotourism was starting to become a big thing at the time. So it was giving them that information. You know, um, we were, were lucky, it, I mean, it was a very difficult time because just after we came back in there, the civil unrest in Ethiopia happened. So we're not actually, we can't actually communicate with, the, with our colleagues at the University of Makale at the moment. We haven't for a few years now, but um, we were planning, you know, the Open University had, had gifted us a set of microscopes when we were going to go out there and set up this infrastructure out there for, for local schools. And I hope one day that we can, can go back and, and, and do that. We have still kept our links with, with Ethiopia. Um, Michael Macy and I have a PhD student at the University of Science and Technology in Addis Baba. Um, in Ethiopia, and he'll hopefully be coming over in September to use our molecular biology facilities. We've tried to help the university there set up the first molecular biology labs in Northern Africa, but with the situation there at the moment, it's quite difficult. So where we can help, we, we can support them to come over and work with us. Um, but at the time, we were, you know, the science and the analog work was starting to develop, but we also started to realize that the research that we were doing had an application as well. It could be applied. One of the things that we started to look at, Manish, you're going to love this picture, aren't you? You're shaking your head. <laughs> you gave me the photo. <laughs> um, it's about planetary protection. And this is about um, the practice of protecting solar sister bodies from contamination by Earth life and protecting Earth from possible life forms that may have been returned from other solar systems. Bodies, sorry. Um, at the time, Vic Pearson and I started, had been doing some work um, regarding regulations of planetary protection in the outer solar system as part of a project that the EU had funded. Um, and I was quite lucky because also at the time, again, I'm going to do a photo. Here's me at the UN in, in Vienna. Um, I was very lucky that the UK Space Agency were looking for a representative on the COSPAR panel, um, planetary protection panel, um, and I was lucky enough to be selected. 
And we're very lucky today to have Athena, in, Athena the chair of the panel, in the audience. So thank you, Athena. Um, so we started to start thinking about plant protection. So from a regulation perspective, but also as a science, very much interested in looking at using that whole concept of biosignatures to look at bio burden. So some of the work we've been doing with ESGI and one of our project officers is looking at using quick um, methods to, to be able to monitor this in clean rooms. Um, and we've been working a little bit with Airbus in this area and we have, um, um, they co-funded a PhD student with us who, Sylvia, who is now a um, plant protection officer at, at ESA. And we're looking with them, help looking at work, looking at the survivability of organisms from clean room environments under simulated Mars conditions, seeing how this can impact our, our understanding of what is going, you know, what, what, what actually are these bio burdens are. And this also led to other commercial opportunities. We had the we have the pleasure at the Open University of working with Garrett Morgan, who is our, um, this is Suzanne Schwenson, not Garrett Morgan, sorry, I should have explained that. Um, Garrett Morgan, who is our knowledge exchange expert. Um, some of the work that he's done, again, is looking, going back to that concept of looking at biosignatures for evidence of life or contamination, whichever way you look at it. Susanna at the time was also doing some contract work for Airbus with, with um, the XMRs. But what's Taft did was he opened our eyes to opportunities that what you can do with science, the commercial opportunities it can offer. So with his help, we put together an STFC IAA award, which has allowed us to look at the commercial opportunities of this work. Um, and that was, was a bit of a, a change in mindset for, for us. So we kind of, as a group, we started to think about astrobiology in the context of not just science, but international development, education, governance, and commercialization. And what we realized was that this was like, had the opportunity to be such a big multidisciplinary research area. So when a call came out to look to build a multidisciplinary research center, we called on, um, I cold called actually, the heads of the strategic research areas within the university. So Simon Lee was head of citizens and governance at the time. We had Giles Mohan was international development, inclusive innovation, and Anu Hollands um, was, is head of the space SRA. And I remember cold calling them and go, look, I've got this idea. Is there any chance we can get people together from across the university? And we did. I think I've never had imposter syndrome so much in my life. Was as an early career lecturer. I think I just made lecture. I think Vic was senior lecturer at the time. Um, we had this meeting where it was just us and a group of professors from across the university. And I think that was a game changer because having the support and the support and belief of those academics really helped us to kind of formulate this concept of Astrobiology OU. You know, the African saying says it builds, it takes a, a community to build a child. I think for us, Astrobiology OU was built by the support that we had from the academics around us. Because I think, you know, that has made such a difference for us. So when Research England um, put out a call um, back in 2018 for a research group where they were looking at these kind of six, these five specific things about taking a small research group with a potential to grow that could deliver economic and societal impact. We felt we we're in a strong position that we hit a lot of these, these oh, that we hit a lot of these points. So we put together um, as a team the, uh, an Expand and Excellent in England um, award and we were lucky enough to be awarded 6.7 million, and this allowed us to um, build Astrobiology OU. So the kind of the key take home message of Astrobiology OU is to address the scientific governance and ethical challenges associated with like, astrobiology in a sustainable way. And the way you do that is we work across boundaries, but not just from scientific perspective, and bringing in our colleagues and the other faculties as well. And we're kind of focused around these key areas, so finding evidence of life. That's not just from a science perspective, so looking at habitable environments. It's also looking at the ethical implications of this, and of looking for life and finding evidence. And we actually have a new fellow starting later this year who's, who is a looking at environmental ethics. It was very much looking at plant protection again, building on some of the work that I mentioned about detecting, um, developing 
protocols for measuring um, bio burden. We've also recently started some work with the UK Space Agency looking at their regulations and um, regarding plant protection and UK launch. And then the earth and analogue. So again, looking at it from a scientific perspective, um, are these extreme environments, understanding how microbial life lives in them, but also looking at the impact this has on the local human populations. And I suppose in the middle of that is the societal um, impact. So international development, engagement, and seeing how we can apply astrobiology's research to meet societal needs. So although we have been hit by COVID over the last three years, I think we've been pretty successful. I think we've managed, I think for me though, the, the main point is we've managed to keep 21 PhD students alive during COVID. Um, I think that has to be a big achievement and the fact that we have had um, six survivors and they've all gone well as well. So I think that has to be the major achievement for me. A wise, I would say old professor um, told me that you should always finish your inaugural about talking about where you're going to be for your career. I've got at least 20 years left. I'm not going anywhere soon. Um, but as astrobiology, I think the next 20 years or so is going to be so exciting. We've got Mars sample return. We've got missions to the icy moons, including Europa and Enceladus. You know, we've got the James Webb telescope. You've all seen the pictures, hopefully, this morning. You know, one of their goals is to look at atmosphere and exoplanets to search the building blocks of life elsewhere in the universe. And, you know, we even potentially have humans on the moon and Mars. Again, this, this is prime opportunity um, for astrobiology. Um, personally, I have a lot of ideas um, that I have, that I'd like to do over this time. And only if a small part of them come to fruition, I will be extremely busy and extremely happy. But success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. So for me, it's about the future generation. You know, in Astrobiology OU, we spent a lot of time building up the next generation. And I will be successful if I can play a small part in these guys and what they can do in the future, because I'm really excited to see what the group can do going forward. Um, I have, thank you. There's so many people I would like to thank you, but specifically I would like to thank Julia Barkin and the lab team. I mean, you guys have been amazing. We went from zero to um, quite a few labs now. Um, so thank you for all the support during that. I'd thank, like to thank Suzanne Schwenzer and Vic Pearson for sharing a brain cell, for being the best work colleagues and friends someone can have, especially over the last um, five to 10 years. I'd love to thank Louise um, for keeping me on the straight and narrow and not breaking too many AU rules. Um, and my family and my husband for not trying to change me and my children for just being amazing. So thank you. Karen, thank you very much for that thrilling account of what got you here. An inaugural lecture should be about the beginning. We're inaugurating something. But what a basis for that beginning. Thank you very much. Let's go across there and we'll take some questions, if we could, please. Uh, we've been joined online, I know, by all the places that you've referred to around the world. Botswana, Ethiopia. I think you should take that one. No, then I you thought can... I could take this one. Really? All right. <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> Who told you? Look out at your audience there. Come, come, come around a bit. There we are, that's better. Um, Ethiopia, uh, Botswana, um, they were mentioned, New Zealand, you mentioned. We've probably got questions from them online, and they will be relayed from the bottom here with roving microphones going around. Uh, if you wait for a mo roving microphone, we'll be able to get your question in. Keep it short, please, but start by saying who you are. So we'll open for questions, and while people are thinking, I hope you have been thinking just now, I might go to, for an online contribution First, can I do that? And while that's happening, could I get a microphone down to there, please? So, Hannah, have you got something for us? I do. There's been loads coming in. Uh, Hannah hasn't got a microphone. Hannah could, could, could Hannah have that microphone? <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Um, there have been plenty of questions coming through, so I'm just going to quickly filter through and just see which ones we've got. Please keep them coming. Um, so the first one is a nice sciencey one for Karen. Um, so how does studying the halophiles um, and how are they significant to astrobiology rather than studying extremophiles? 
I think it depends on what you're trying to study. I think Heller files are particularly of relevance when we're looking at the surface of Mars nowadays. So we know that there's evaporitic deposits on the surface of Mars and that microbes potentially could be entombed within those salt crystals. And what we know from looking at Earth, that the helophilic organisms can actually live in these um, entombed salts. They can survive in those entombed salts. And this is some work that the group's been doing. So helophiles are very relevant for kind of present-day preservation of biosignatures. I seem to cover it. Uh, Kat, yes, please, your question. Um, Mark Brandon, STEM faculty. Um, you seem to have banished quite a lot of members of Astrobiology OU around all of the extreme environments on the Earth. <laughs> I wondered if you had any extreme environments you haven't visited yet, and why would you want to go to them? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I ha see, I haven't been to hardly any of them. It's all the team that gets to go. They get the exciting part. Um, we've, I think the Azores would be quite an interesting... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> The Azores would be quite interesting. There's quite a lot of hydrothermic activity going on there. Um, you know, I think some of the remote high... I mean, I think Africa's got a lot to offer for analogue work. I think there's so many un untapped resources there. And we recently actually had a professor from Botswana over visiting, and we were discussing about the possibilities of setting up a um, North African analogue site, because there's so much variety. And I think a lot of them are untapped. And it's just getting that balance about... Um, you know, about going there and studying them. So, yeah, I think it's very much what this, watch this space as we open up some of these analogue sites. Uh, while I wait for the next question, I'll just say, I think one of the things that you've done as well, isn't it, is that you use the local people as well, indigenous people, yeah. uh, so that this is from a sustainability point of view, which matters a lot to me, you're not necessarily yeah. sending people out. Yeah. Tell us one of those. So a prime example would be the work we did in Botswana, so Alex is actually in the crowd today. So we went out, visited the University of Abuse, we went in the field with their master's students, we collected cores, we split the cores 50-50, they analysed their half, we analysed ours, and we published papers together. So it's very much about that relationship. And then it worked when we couldn't go out with COVID. They went and collected samples because we have such a, a, a nice working relationship with them that they, they want to work with us. So it is, it's about building that trust and, and developing those, that, that work with them. Excellent. Uh, let's see, is there another question in the room? Hands up if you have. Yes, there's one here. Could I get a microphone across, please? Hi, Monica Grady, STEM faculty. Karen, you, you talked about ethics, and you said you've got an ethics fellow coming later on in the year. All right. What do you think the effect will be on humanity if we find life, say, on Mars or in the oceans of Enceladus or Europa? What is your perspective. Monica, why did you have to ask that? I know, I know, I know. It's because lots of people ask me and it's like, I don't know the answer. Yeah, I, I think that's a really, a really interesting question. I think it also depends where you find it, because if you find it in the subsurface oceans of Europa, it's probably going to be different genesis of life. So to me, that, yeah, that, that is a very complicated question. Um, I think it'll have profound effect if we do find life. You're nodding, so I'm saying the right thing here. I think it would have profound effect, and I think we would have to be careful with how it's dealt, how it's communicated. Um, the paper that came out from Jim Green in, um, in Nature uh, a couple of months ago about how we have to make sure we get the evidence for that, and I think that's all important as scientists. We need to take responsibility for that communication and how we interact with, with, with the public on that as well. So I think... Yeah, I think it would very be a much, um, yeah, an open, it, it could go one way or the other. Yes, question here, please. Oh, sorry, I'll come back to you in a minute, Hannah. David Mayle from Life Sciences. If you got an organism back from Mars, say, what criteria would you use to decide whether it had evolved on Mars or whether it had arrived from Earth, say? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's, there's a big debate about that. Um, I think, you know, if life had evolved on Mars separately, you know, we, we would look at, I think the idea would be that we, if it is, you know, very similar to terrestrial life, sequencing, looking where it fits within the, the finely digested tree, these are all ways and, and means of doing it, and to see if it 
where if it's deeply branched, because it could be, you know, from early Earth, early Mars, the conditions are very similar, and if life was transferred, it could be, very, you know, very similar in that way. So I think it would be very much a, um, yeah, a look and see kind of as we as we develop the information about the organism. Okay, let's go to Hannah for another online one, please. Lovely. So this is coming from an OU student, um, and hopefully this will be. An, an easier question than perhaps one that was posed slightly earlier. Um, astrobiology is a multidisciplinary subject, but are some STEM degrees better suited to work in astrobiology? That's from Guy. Yeah, and I think it depends what part of astrobiology you want to do, because it's so interdisciplinary. It, um, you know, there's, it, it depends what you're, you know, you're interested in. So I was obviously interested in biology and life sciences, so that's the degree decision that I took. Then I look at other members of the group, they took more of a geology background. So I think it's what interests you. Because I think astrobiology is so diverse. There's, it's multifaceted. And I think you need to pick what's interested for you, and then you can apply it to astrobiology. Can I pick up on that one as well and just ask, you talked about the way that Vic Pearson act as a, acted as a translator between you and Susanna Schwenzer. Can you give us an illustration of the sorts of things that you were finding difficult to um, communicate I mean, about? Geologists. I mean, they talk a different <laughs> language. Um, <laughs> I think it's really interesting, and I think we've we found this, is, is terminology is very different um, between, two, I can't think of an example right now, but, you know, I, I you know, habitability me, um, Susanna's looking at very methodically about what is in the environment, whereas I'm looking at can life live in there, so it's kind of that way, and I think I had to learn a lot about geology from Susanna and Vic, and they've hopefully learned a little bit from me about biology, and it's just understanding that actually it's okay to go do you know what I don't understand what you're saying can you please explain and I think that's what we've done as a group because mm. it's been a it has been a problem because we've done that we've had to do it from a science perspective but then bring in the social scientists and it's a whole different ball game habitability and is, is, is a different different conversation as well so it's just being open and and, and trying to to work that and I think um, we discussed having a dictionary where we can translate some of these words and I think that's something we should probably readdress another publication now. <laughs> uh, have we another question from the room? Uh, some questions over on this side here. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Rick Holland from STEM Faculty. Uh, thank you, Karen. Fabulous talk. I'm going to take you back to the start, uh, to that uh, young person in the Welsh village uh, in North Wales, or indeed potentially uh, somebody in an Ethiopian village, and ask you what piece of advice would you give them if you could give one piece of advice to a young aspiring scientist to become somebody like you? Don't do it. No. Um, uh. <laughs> um, I think I think it's very much about um, you know doing only doing it if you enjoy it, and also respect the people you're working with, and um, and make communication is, is key to that. And I think it is about enjoyment and really wanting to do it, and just being kind to people as well, because you're going to meet a lot of people and collaborate with lots of people. And I think it's just about having those. Um, traits and just enjoying what you're doing really because science can be tough you know there's a lot of lows there's some highs but there's a lot of lows and you not you need to really love what you're doing to do it thank you was there another question over here hey Karen um, congratulations first of all and I just wanted to say how um, lucky we are in our uh, COSPAR panel on planetary protection to have Karen not only because she can translate all the difficult words. Um, I'm a planetologist, so I don't understand everything. But also she knows how to explain the methane thing in a politically correct way. Um, and, and, and so because you are an expert on methane and you brought all those cows out there, um, I, I had a question that relates to that because, uh, like Monica, I've been asked regularly as, as a Titan expert, what do you think about methanogens and whether those things can exist and, and be, you know, these little organisms and if you could say something about that. I mean, methanogens aren't the easiest thing to grow on Earth, um, <laughs> as I can see some of the people giggling in the group. Um, but I think, you know, the, the concept of what they, they need to grow is just hydrogen and CO2. And if you, if you have, you know, you've got hydrogen, CO2, and you've got the, you know, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus in that environment, and the liquid water, potentially, you know, you have the ingredients. If it's there, potentially, 
they they could grow. I think that you know they're they're um, a group of organisms which you know they're very um, well adapted to some of these extreme environments. Yes, um, I'm Athena Kustenis, and um, <laughs> I'm from France. <laughs> Um, not from France originally, but um, in France, San Andreas. So okay, yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other question from the room? We're at the back, please. Yes. Hi, I'm Veli from the Astrobiology Group. So I was wondering, um, what, in your opinion, what this Mars sample return means for the future of astrobiology? I think Mars Sample Turn is such an exciting mission, the fact that we'll be able to bring samples back um, and analyse them. I think you know, the, the missions we've got, um, the rovers on Mars at the moment are great. Um, we, we can do some analysis there, but actually getting them back into, in, in, onto Earth so we can do some analysis with the high-tech equipment that we have here on Earth, I think it's just fantastic for astrobiology. Um, hopefully it will answer some of those questions that um, we want to know about habitability and life on Mars. To what extent are you worried about us taking things to Mars? It's a big question. And um, yeah, I think planetary protection needs to be respected. I think that um, there, there are such stringent methods and, and protocols in place to make sure that we don't contaminate Mars. I think for the ExoMars rover, there was under, over 30,000 swipes taken, swabs, to look at the biocontamination. So we... As a, as a community, we take it very seriously, and I think that's something which um, we need to maintain. There's a question in the middle at the front here. <laughs> One row back. Sorry, I've done, I'm, I'm on my way. Thank you very much. Karen, don't look scared, please. <laughs> Helen Fraser, STEM faculty. So I want to follow on from that question, actually. Um, You've mentioned that you're doing a lot of work with the UK Space Agency around UK launch. And obviously, we've all seen, and I'm, I think I can say it without being libelous, um, some, um, some commercial entities launch lots of things, and some sovereign nations launch things and accidentally crash them into planets, which have led to contamination. So can you comment on how much the, the sort of sphere of where you're working and, and the, the, the risk of planetary protection is changing as space becomes an incredibly commercial entity and that is what's driving us forward there. I think that's more than a UK launch because, you know, I think what you're talking about specifically is around, around probably the Mars environment. I think, you know, I think it's about working together. It's getting buy-in from the community. And I think Crossbar, has done a lot, the Castle Planet Protection Panel has done a lot of work on this and it's about working as a community to ensure that we keep Mars, um, you know, we don't contaminate it and working together with the agencies and the private entities to make sure that we're in a situation where you know we have these guidelines and these, these regulations in place, these guidelines. Okay, we're going to go back to Hannah for some online. We've had a, a question from online uh, which says, do we assume that life on other planets is similar to life on Earth? And how can we detect life elsewhere if it works completely different way? And that's from Stacey Phillips, who in fact made our Lego yeah, videos. Yeah, I'm sure she says hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I mean, that, that's the, another one of those, those big questions. And I think, you know, the way I look at it is I'm very much focused on it. That it could, you know, it could, it's probably going to be potentially like what we have you know, look, single, it's not going to be little green men. It's going to be very, very much, if we did find life, single organisms. Um, so that's why we used to study micro, microbiology. And I think, you know, there would be, you know, we know what the key ingredients for life is on Earth. So we would be able to look at this potential life to see if it has some of those key traits. And I think if you, it depends on the location as well. So, for example, as I mentioned, the icy moons would be a different genesis, whereas Mars, it could potentially be um, transported from, from Earth. Thank you very much. I've just got one last thing from online. We received an email, in fact, um, from your PhD student in Ethiopia. And I just wanted to read it to you, if that's OK. It's just very short. Um, but it says, Dear Professor Karen, I am pleased to say congratulations on your inaugural lecture. You are, yeah, you are the one going to make the great impact on my career. And I look forward to your mentorship as my PhD supervisor, too. May the event be successful. And best wishes in your continued success. 
Very good. Uh, and, and it's a good point, I think, to draw the conversation here to a close. We've got other things to go on and think about. And Kevin, over to you. Thanks very much, Nick. Just on behalf of everybody, thanks to, to Karen, but also to Nick for a, a great uh, discussion, a great lecture. Karen, what really shone through to me there, obviously your own personal commitment and determination, but also the fact that your successes are down to a, a large community. And I think it's great that so many people are here today on, in Milton Keynes, but I'm also sure online, the, the, the local OU family that supported you, the UK community, but also the international community that's come along. And I think that that's a lot down to you, but, um, but also I'd like to thank on behalf of Karen, everyone who's been part of this fantastic story. So, so let me bring things to a close um, today, just to say that if you have attended today, we will ask you for some feedback on the, on the, uh, the organization and the session today. So look out uh, for that. We also, want to advertise our next um, inaugural lecture, which is going to be by John but um, Butcher. John's um, going to be speaking on the theme of widening participation. So we hope you're able to make that either um, in person um, or online. Um, and after the lecture, we're going to have a few um, refreshments. So if you can join us downstairs, if you're able to, that would be fantastic. And, and finally, just on behalf of everyone, can we again just thank Karen for a fantastic lecture? <laughs>